What's up guys? My name is Dustin Lang. I'm the online pastor here at New Story Church. I wanna welcome you to our YouTube channel. Here we'll be posting content that inspires you, that challenges you, and most importantly, leads you closer to Jesus. Hope you enjoy. Hey Siri, how long will it take me to find the one? According to Tinder.com, you could find someone right now. Hey Alexa, am I fulfilling my life's purpose? I cannot answer that question, but will order your best life now by Joe Lustine with your Prime account. Hey Google, what's going to happen in my future? The closest psychic is located on the corner of 22nd and Olive Street. For real answers to life's toughest questions, ask God. Amen. Sometimes you just have to ask God. Well, welcome to New Story Church here at our Jefferson campus. Uh, again, I just want to kind of reiterate what uh, Tricia was sharing there. Thank you to everyone who parked at LATTC and you took the shuttle, you, you made the extra effort. Thank you for doing that. It really helps out our first time guests as well as our families uh, with kids and special needs. It's really, really helpful. Also want to give a quick, very quick shout out uh, to all the ladies in the house who came to Mother's Day last week. Thank you for coming again this Sunday. Thank you for being here right now. In spite of that dreadful story I shared with you about my Mother's Day mishap 14 years ago, okay? I received a lot of, um, I won't say emails or hate calls, but uh, a lot of dirty looks. Uh, a lot of you shared how you wanted to throw something at me. Uh, hit me. Some of you did after the service. Uh, a lot of the men, I will have you know, though, were very appreciative. Uh, a lot of the men thanked me afterwards. And uh, if you weren't here last week, please do me a favor. Do not ask anyone what that story was about. Anyways, uh, so good to have you guys. In case we haven't met yet, my name is Tom. I'm yet to serve as one of the pastors here. And uh, today we are kind of rounding the corner uh, in our spring series called Ask God. This is our third part to a four-part series. And um, you know, we're going way beyond the typical kind of questions you would ask that thing right there. We're going beyond the questions of, you know, like, you know, what's the weather going to be like or directions to this place or that. We're moving on to the bigger questions of life, bigger dilemmas like, what is God's plan for me? Or in a world full of so many choices, you know, should I choose this thing right over here, fill in the blank, or should I choose that thing over here, which also looks very appealing, makes a lot of sense, seems like there's some wisdom there, uh, fill in the blank with this or that. Uh, you know, there are several sources out there. Uh, just recently, I've been reading a couple of articles, one by uh, Fast Company, another by Wired Magazine, that addresses this topic called paralysis by analysis, right? This is the idea that basically we live in a world with there so many sheer amount of choices in life that it often becomes really, really difficult to make just one decision. Now, I don't know about you, but does anyone else get freaked out just looking at this picture? Anyone else like your anxiety level? Yeah, me too. I just like, oh, I get so tense, right? Uh, the other day I was in Target just looking for toothpaste, right? Just looking for simple toothpaste. And the entire aisle is just all toothpaste products, right? And, and you know, we live in a world today where it's no longer about brick and mortar stores. It's everything's online. And as soon as you go online, like the, cho the choices are like literally hundreds upon hundreds. I mean, no longer do you have two or three choices. Now you have hundreds upon hundreds, right? Which I guess if we're talking about toothpaste and appetizers, that's not a big deal, right? I mean, that's a picture of uh, Cheesecake Factory's menu. It weighs 25 pounds, okay? Has 30 different kinds of salads, right? Different 50 kinds of appetizers. I don't go to Cheesecake Factory anymore, not only because of the prices, but just because it just makes me anxious. Like, it's, it's too much. It's just too much, right? And this, and look at this, Colgate. This is just Colgate brand, right? This, we're not even talking about Crest. We're not even talking about Aquafresh. We're just, just Colgate. Like, what kind of Colgate uh, do you want, right? It's absolutely crazy. But what happens when the stakes are much higher? What happens when the, question, the questions of life are much more significant? They're much more dire, right? What happens to you when you have to choose, let's say, for instance, between a, uh, maybe progressing in your career or a certain relationship in your life? 
right? What do you do then? What happens if, if you're deciding, like, is this the person that I'm really supposed to marry? Or, gosh, is God calling me maybe to be single for the rest of my life? Would that be okay, right? What about all these choices in between? What if I choose the wrong one? What if I make the wrong decision? See, sometimes, oftentimes, we make our decisions and our decisions make us. Does that make sense? We make our decisions and our decisions make us. So how do we make good decisions? How do we become decisive in a wise manner? How do we follow God's unique plan for our lives? Well, here's the deal. I want to show you a passage from Scripture today that helps us with these type of questions. So I'm going to ask our friend Marlon to come on up. And he's going to read for us a passage of scripture today uh, written by, oh yeah, he got, you got a woo. I don't get woos, but you get woo. Let's give it up for Marlon here, all right? He's got a, that's a nice jacket. He's got a, he's got a passage of scripture, uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 22 to 24. This is written by the Apostle Paul, and take it away, Marlon. I feel so special. <laughs> um, okay, Acts 20, 20 to, 22 to 24. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Amen. This is God's word. Let's hear it here for Marlon one more time. Good stuff. Good stuff. So good. Well, friends, there, there's a lot to unpack in that simple little passage there. So if you're taking notes, uh, here's what I'd love for you to do. Here's what I encourage you to do. Uh, first thing is to jot down pretty much the guiding principle that has really guided us uh, throughout this entire series and will continue to do so. If, you're, if today is your first time here at New Story Church, you need to know that Proverbs 16, verse 9, the principles that we see in that passage is the guiding principle. It's kind of what we're hanging the entire series on. And that guiding principle is this. We make our plans. You can go ahead and jot this down in your notes. We make our plans, but God is the one who guides our steps. You and I, we know how to make plans, but God is the one who guides our steps. And I know that you know how to make plans because we do it all the time, right? This is the time of the year usually when we start making our vacation plans, right? Make life plans, lunch plans, plans at work. Uh, we have planning meetings, right? We have five-year plans and 10-year plans, et cetera, et cetera. But what does it actually mean that God, in the midst of all those plans, would actually guide our steps? What does that actually mean? Well, when you take a look back at our first verse that we just read here, that Marlon just read for us, verse 22, it says this, and now, now compelled by the what? Spirit. Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. See, friends, God guides our steps in many ways. In fact, this is part three of a four-part series. In week one, we talked about one of the ways that God guides our steps is through open and closed doors, right? We talked about the man, the vision from Macedonia and how Paul was led here, not there because of a closed door and the open door here and all that stuff, right? So open and closed doors. You can check out any message that we have online. You can go to newstorychurch.com slash messages, find all our stuff there. But other times, right, other than circumstantial closed and open doors, right, other times, there are, there are times in life where God sometimes will use his Holy Spirit to actually compel you to do something, to go somewhere, to take a step of faith. See, understand this. The Apostle Paul, I want to give you a little bit of a contextual understanding here. The Apostle Paul, in this particular passage, as he's writing this in Acts chapter 20, when he's talking about how the Spirit is compelling him to do something, what's actually happening is the Apostle Paul is in the city of Ephesus, right? It's where we get our New Testament book, the book of Ephesians, right? He gets the new, he's in the city of Ephesus, and he really liked Ephesus. He had some really great relationships in Ephesus. Uh, this was a great place. Ephesus was was a, just a great place to live. It was a great place to be, sort of like living in La Cañada, right? 
right? In fact, when Paul, when Paul was about to leave, Scripture says that everyone started crying. They started weeping, and they started embracing him and like, no, no, don't leave, right? I mean, because after all, who wants to leave Bel Air? Who wants to leave Palos Verdes, right? Th then, then it uses these words. It says this, quote, torn ourselves away from them. We had finally gotten to a point where we, to we had torn ourselves away from them. In other words, there was a ripping of relationships. There was a ripping of, 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 of heart ties. There was a ripping of familiarity. There was a ripping of love. It's like we had to tear ourselves away from Ephesus and the people that we love in Ephesus. Simply put, Paul wanted to stay. He wanted to stay in Ephesus. He clearly, truly, really did not want to lead, leave Ephesus. Yet notice what Paul says next. Verse 22, and now compelled, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to where? Corona, exactly, right? <laughs> Friends, I was just seeing if you're paying attention. Friends, that word there, compelled in the original Greek, is didom didominos, didominos, which literally means, that word compelled, didominos, literally means bound up, like you're wrapped up tightly, like you're just, you, like as if with a rope, you're just bound, you're tied up, okay? And, and so you take this word compelled, bound, wrapped up. In other words, what, what Paul is trying to say here is there are times that the Spirit of God actually binds you up. It, it ties you up. It, it binds you. It was bound, wrapped up. There are times where the Spirit of God does that to you, and you feel like you have no choice. Now, the reality is you always have a choice. You always have a choice. But the feeling, the, the, the feeling that you have is I have no, my heart is bound. My mind is bound. My will is bound. Something outside of me is binding me and is forcing me to make this decision. Sometimes... God will use his spirit to compel you to do something so that you feel like you have no choice. You actually have to do this. You must do this. You know, we've got a friend here at New Story Church, uh, the Chu family, and Grace and Fred Chu. Uh, look at this picture, all right? This is a beautiful family, incredible family, all right? And uh, yeah, a lot of oohs and ahs. You get, you get oohs and ahs too. So Marlon gets it, you get it. Not, uh, just, anyways, uh, so anyways, uh, this is a beloved family here at New Story Church. And a few weeks ago, I think it was like uh, less than a month ago, right? The week after Easter or so, uh, we had a baptism Sunday around here. Okay, and it was it's just an awesome Sunday. Praise God. I mean, 20 people got baptized, right? Between the two services, 20 people got baptized. And you know what's incredible about, the, about the, that particular, I don't know if, if, if everyone is aware of this, but 16 people that particular Sunday morning woke up and they knew they were going to get baptized. Like they had signed something before, we got them ready, you know, that whole sort of thing. We prepared them. So they knew they were going to get baptized, right? Four people woke up that morning and had no idea that they were going to get baptized. They had no, they just, it was just a normal, regular, old Sunday to them. Like, great, oh yeah, Easter was great last week, I'm going to go to church this week, I'm going to get my worship on, I'm going to see my friends, uh, have some good food, whatever, whatever, uh, but it's just a normal, four people had those kind of intentions in mind. And somewhere, through the course of the service, through the preaching of God's word, God's spirit somehow was already working in the 16, but in four individuals started working in a very specific way, okay? And, and, and so when, when the altar call was given, and I'm just going to share something like totally candidly here, just like, just as a human, right? Um, I've given many altar calls before, right? And there's like this element, like just speaking humanly, just honestly, right? There's an element of any time I give an altar call, I'm just like, oh, Lord, please. Like, what if no one responds, right? Like, oh, I'm going to look like an idiot. Like, this is so stupid. I don't want to do this. We just had Easter. Easter was awesome. Let's not have a downer, God. I don't want to give an altar call, right? So I'm just like thinking this in my head. But it's like, Tom, dude, idiot, it's not about you. It's about God. So you just have to be faithful. Leave the results to God, right? That's always the case in life, right? Especially with ministry, right? So it's like, okay, we give an altar call. In my mind, I'm telling you this to you. I, uh, uh, just, okay, just, just bear with me. In my mind, I'm honestly thinking to myself, Grace, Grace represents, I mean, just look at this picture, right? Grace represents, in my mind, a demographic 
that is never going to get spontaneously baptized. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? It's like they just, there's just no way someone like Grace would get back. What am I saying? It's like, I mean, look, it's like, it's like she walked out of a magazine, right? Her hair's perfect. Her makeup's perfect. And she, beauty needs grace. Like, that's even her, that's even like... There's no way in my mind, like in my mind, when I give an altar call, I'm not even thinking about that demographic. I'm not thinking about moms who are made up, have perfect hair, have little kids. Like uh, there's no way that person, spontaneous baptism is someone for like you, like you, you're going to get spontaneous. Like I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, no offense to you, sir. But anyways, uh, <laughs> So like, in my mind, I'm like trying to talk to this person, but like over here, God's doing something. And it was just amazing. Like, I'm not even kidding. I'm not, I'm not embellishing. I'm not over speaking. Like I literally, as the service was going and as we were baptizing people, you know, I, I like saw her like go towards like the spontaneous era, get her towel and like the Walmart shorts and the t-shirt and stuff like that. And I'm just like, wait, wh who, is that Grace? What is that? And like, I made my way over to her and I'm just like, What's going on? And like, are you sure this is about baptism? And she was like literally shaking, literally shaking, and it was having a hard time like verbalizing what was going on, right? And she's sharing this. And then after the baptism, after the baptism, she was sharing with me how, you know what, Pastor Tom, like as you were preaching and I just knew like this was my next step. God was telling me, Meet me in the waters. Meet me. This is your next step of faith. Get out of the boat. Meet me in the waters. Have a spirit of Peter. Be like Peter. And I was just, I, he was pressing down on me. Grace, do you remember saying this? You said he was pressing down on me. And I felt, you actually said, felt so uncomfortable. Oh, but I thought it's the peace of God. It transcends all understanding. No, you said that you felt uncomfortable until, do you remember when? Until the second you placed your foot into that tub. The second she placed her foot into that tub was when peace came over her whole body, her whole life, her, all of her emotions. And do you remember what I said? I said, that's surrender. That's surrender. See, there comes a time in your life, there come many opportunities in your life where the Spirit of God is actually prompting you it's binding you. It's compelling you. It's encouraging you. It's urging you. And you have a choice at that point. Submit or not. Surrender or not. So friends, I got, I got like one main question this morning. And that is this. Do you like really, really want to know God's will for your life? Like, I, I get, like, you know, on, a, on a, like an intellectual level or maybe even just, like, a curiosity level, like, yeah, it'd be kind of cool to know the creator of the universe's plan for my life. Like, I get that. But what I'm, a I'm not asking you that. I'm not asking you about curiosities. I'm not asking you about conveniences. What I'm asking you is, like, do you truly want to know God the Father's unique plan for you and who you are today? And why you were created. Do you want to know that plan? In other words, are you going to be ready to surrender and to submit to it should he reveal it to you? If so, go ahead and jot number one down, first point of the day. Number one, pay attention to the Spirit's prompting. Pay attention. If that's you, you need to pay attention to the Spirit's prompting. Pay attention to the Spirit's compelling because I've got news for you, friends. The Spirit of God wants to prompt you, guide you, lead you, compel you. But many times we're not ready to listen. See, friends, I, I want to share a little bit of theology with you here. Did you know that the, the moment, the, the, just the moment, the second that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, did you know that at that very second, instantaneously, Jesus, God the Father, places a gift inside of you, a deposit inside of you. That deposit is called the Holy Spirit. 
We're not going to take the time today to go into it. We'll probably do a whole series on the Holy Spirit a little bit later. But Ephesians, you can just jot this down in your notes. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, as well as 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you can go, that, uh, go over that uh, in your own study, in your own devotion, maybe during a small group. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13, those are just kind of two passages. So basically, the, the, the second, the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you confess your sins, you accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice for you, God deposits the Holy Spirit uh, inside of you, inside of your person, inside of your soul, inside of your spirit, as it were. And, and the Holy Spirit, also called the helper, also called the comforter, also called the counselor, right? The Holy Spirit's function, the Holy Spirit's purpose in, in, in life, and the reason why he exists is to prompt you. It is to guide you. It is to compel you towards the things of God. Friends, did you know that before you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were an enemy of God? Your heart was opposed to God. As a matter of fact, your heart was dead. You were dead in your sins before Christ. But because you, if you, accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, what was dead is now made alive. It's not that what was bad is made good. It's that what was dead was made alive. And you who were once far away were brought near. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given as a deposit. It's a jump start into your life. And you were once enemies of God. You had no heart for God. God had to move first and give you a heart for himself. God had to move first and, 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 and the scales came off your eyes. You were once an enemy of God. You were once far from God. But now that the Holy Spirit is in your life, now your heart is actually moved towards God. That's what it means to be a new creation. And so now that your heart is moved towards God, now you're like, wait, why isn't my life perfect? Why do I still struggle with like addictions? Why do I still struggle with thoughts? Why do I still, well, now your heart is doing battle. Before it wasn't doing battle because it had nothing to battle because you were dead. But now through the spirit of Christ, you're now alive and now your heart is bent towards God where before it wasn't. And so that's why you feel a battle. But you know what? <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Jesus explained it this way. In the Gospel of John, he says this. But the helper, the who, the? Holy the Holy Spirit's the helper. Jesus says the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will what? He will, he will teach you all things. And he will what? Remind you of everything I've taught you. Everything I've said. The Holy Spirit will remind you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will guide you. So friends, don't ever, ever brush off the Holy Spirit. Don't ever ignore the Spirit's prompting. If you have a good thought that resonates with God's heart, you can consider that God's spirit prompting you. That's not your own heart. Your heart was dead apart from Christ. But now Jesus has begun a good work in you. And so any good thought, any good motive that you have, that's God's spirit breathing life. And what I'm saying is don't ignore that. Move towards that and let that move you. Does that make sense? See, don't ever brush off the Spirit's prompting. Don't ever ignore the Spirit compelling you to do something. Now watch this. This is amazing. Verse 22, we said this, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Corona, Jerusalem, right? And now watch this. Now this is amazing what happens next. What happens, what he says next is just ridiculous. I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I mean, did you, are, you, are you catching this? Don't, don't miss this, okay? I, I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit, Paul says. I, I'm going to go somewhere I don't want to go. I like it where I am. And this place where I'm going, I don't even know what's going to happen to me there. Wait, well, what? I, wait, Pastor Tom, we got to, you just got to chill out for a second. I thought that, like, if I'm a good Christian man, I'm a good Christian lady, I'm a church lady. I thought if I followed God's plan, he would give me all the details. Right? 
I, I thought if like I submit myself, if I surrender my will to Jesus, I mean, the very least he can do is give me a roadmap, right? I mean, he can give me like a sneak peek at the instructions, yeah? What are you, what are you talking about here? This doesn't make any sense. I, 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 I need the blueprints. No, you don't. Where did you get the idea that he would give you further instructions, a detailed roadmap of everything. Where, 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 like who told, like what verse was that again? Where, where'd you get that idea? No, no, he never ever promises us, us that. That's, that's actually, that's not how it works at all. I mean, just ask the Apostle Paul. I mean, like we spent the first two, three weeks talking about the Apostle Paul and like he wanted to do this, but God had him go, do, go there. He would close doors, the Spirit would compel him, like just like all over the place. But it happened, same thing happened to Peter, same thing happened to James, same thing happened to John. If you go back in the Old Testament, it's all over the place. David does that too, right? David wants to do this. God compels him through his Spirit to do something else, closes doors, whatever. Moses, the same thing. Abraham, right? Abraham, I mean, he's like the king of it. Scripture actually says of Abraham, by faith, Abraham, when called to a place he would later receive as his inheritance. It all kind of begins with the father Abraham, right? By faith, okay, by faith, when he was called to go to this place he had never seen before to get his inheritance, he obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Friends, this is way back in the Old Testament. God's game plan hasn't changed. God wanted to use Abraham to, to just to bring in, to usher in his people, to start a new, a new dynasty, if you will. And so God chooses this guy, Abraham, and says, you know what? I'm going to use you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply your blessings. I just need you to go. Abraham's just like, okay, so all right, I'll go. Like, where am I going? Just go. That's what God says. <laughs> See, Paul, Abraham, David, Peter, John, any significant character, any significant figure throughout all of scriptures that's doing anything significant, all walked by faith, not by, not by sight, which is where we get point number two today, if you're taking notes. Point number two, if you're really, truly trying to follow God's unique plan for your life, number two. Expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. See, because friends, <laughs> let's just have an honest moment here, okay? You and I, come on. You, we want certainty, right? We want clarity, right? We, we want the whole picture. We want to know the whole plan. Like we talked about last week, we want to know step number 7,986 when we still haven't been faithful with steps number two and three over here, right? But we still want to know. We want to know 7,896, even though like we've got, we're staring at step number two, we're staring at step number three, and we're like, I don't know if I'm going to do that, right? But we still want to know that. We still want that clarity, right? Why is it? We want clarity. We want certainty. Why? Because there's something broken inside of us. Because on this side of the cross, there's still a part of you and there's still a part of me that actually doesn't trust God with my whole heart and my whole mind and all of my strength all the time. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. Because in the right situation, or wrong, depending on how you look at it, in that situation, and there are particular situations where given the right set of circumstances, we just abandon faith. We're just like, nope, nope, let me, let me drive. Give me the wheel. I'm going to take care of this. Yet scripture reminds us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So friends, you and I, we need to expect the unexpected. But I hate to say that, and actually I love saying this, but we, we, I hate to say that, but it actually gets worse. 
Okay, it actually gets worse, all right? Uh, I'm going to read uh, this next verse, all right? Uh, we, we need to expect the unexpected, right? Uh, but um, I'm going to read this next verse, and some of you are going to be like, wow, that's, that's extra. No, I can't even go there. I just, but just, just be patient. Uh, it's, it's Sunday. This is church, okay? Verse 23. Look at what verse 23 says. It says, I only know. Okay, you ask me to go somewhere I don't even want to go. I don't even know what all the details are. The Spirit compels me. But I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that what? And what? Prison and hardships are facing me. Friends, I just, just, just look at that passage. Just keep it up there for a second, okay? Just put yourself in the mind of Paul, right? He's living in La Cañada. He doesn't want to leave. God's asking him to move to Corona. He doesn't know what's in Corona except prison and hardships. That's the only guarantee he has, right? I mean, you, you, you could be sitting in your seat right now being like, Pastor Todd, this is just this is ridiculous, okay? I'm a, I'm a good church lady, okay? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a godly man, all right? I loved you. I grew up in church, okay? So I get that the Spirit sometimes tells you to go somewhere you don't want to go. I get sometimes that you don't know all the details, okay? I even get that, you know, it, it's going to be, you know, it, it may not be the easiest thing, but now you're saying that this everywhere, I, the, all, the only thing that the Spirit tells me is that I'm going to be imprisoned or in pain? No thanks. No thanks. And friends, I get that. I totally absolutely, totally get it. But friends, did you know that there are times, even in the midst, and I know you know the verses. I mean, if you grew up in church, you know God's good, pleasing, and perfect. Well, I, even in the midst of God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for all those of you who love him, even in the midst of his perfect will, at least this side of the cross, you need to understand that pain and challenges, maybe not imprisonment like for Paul, but pain and real challenges, those are just parts of the package. That's normal. That, that's life. We live in a broken world right now. This side of the cross, it's a broken world. And so pain and challenges coming up in your life happen all the time, even if you're dead smack in the middle of God's will. So, if you really, truly, absolutely want to live God's plan A for your life, you need to understand point number three, and that is this. You must accept pain and challenges. You can go ahead and jot that down. Pain and challenges. You must accept them. You must. See, because maturity, wisdom... And a good dose of God's grace will help you to embrace this truth. As a matter of fact, just, just look with me at the life of Jesus. Just think about the life of Jesus, right? The Spirit of God actually led... Je would you say that Jesus was led by the Spirit? Yeah? Yeah, would you say that Jesus was in the Father's will? Yeah? Well, did you know that Jesus, who was in the Father's will, never broke from the Father's will? Did you know that Jesus, who was led by the Spirit, was also led to pains and challenges? So then why, if Jesus, my Lord and Savior, who I believe in, who I say that I follow, so if I follow, I'm behind him, he's ahead of me. I, if I follow the footsteps of Jesus, and if Jesus himself was led by the Spirit, into places of pain and challenges, then why would I, someone who follows him, expect anything less in my life? If I'm following him and his footsteps led to pain and challenges, yea, even death, then, then what right do I have to expect anything less? But again, don't take my word for it. This is not just, don't just, you know, no one's coming in here because, oh, they want to hear what Pastor Tom has to say. You want to hear what the word of God has to say. I don't even want to hear, my family doesn't want to hear what I have to say, okay? We want to all hear what, God, what God's word has to say. What does God's word say about this? Well, look at the scriptures. It says this, in, in Matthew, in the beginning of Matthew, it says this. Then Jesus was led by the who? Spirit. Spirit into the what? 
Jesus was le- Jesus, not you, not me, not some pastor, not the Pope, but Jesus himself was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, not the Ritz Carlton, not Laguna Beach, into the wilderness to be tempted by the who? Devil. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, mind you. He didn't eat or drink anything. To be tempted face to face by the devil. See, friends, some people think that if you're in God's will, right, that everything's somehow automatically perfect. That, that, that everything's smooth sailing. That you never have a hardship, that there are never any health concerns, never any financial turns, never any relational strife. If I'm in God's will, well, God loves me. It's God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. So, so then th- that must mean it's smooth sailing. No, that, you know what that's called? That's called Hollywood. <laughs> That's called a fairy tale narrative. That is not scripture. That is not scripture. As a matter of fact, I, I want to do a quick pop quiz here, just a quick a little social uh, exam here, social experiment. Uh, raise your hand, okay? I, I would like everyone here to raise your hand if you want to, if you just desire to. I'm not saying that you are. I'm not placing a judgment whether you are or not. I'm just saying, if you want to live a godly life, let's say, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to raise my hand too. So go, raise, keep them up. Keep them up. If you want to, not saying that you are, I'm just saying if you have a desire to live a godly life, just raise your hand. Okay, now keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay, because I'm going to read for you. Only if your hand is raised, only if your hand is raised, this is for you. Why do you not have your hand raised? Anyways, <laughs> only if your hand is raised, this, this verse is for you. Okay, are you ready? Okay, if you want to live a godly wife, uh, wife, godly life, <laughs> and have a godly wife, (laughs) this is what scripture says. Here we go. It says this. Everyone, keep your hand raised. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will what? Oh, wait. Why are the hands going down? Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. People, okay, you put your hands down. We get it. We get it. (laughs) Everyone. Guys, what, what does the original Greek mean there when it says everyone? <laughs> it means everyone. Yeah, it's a good guess. Everyone. Everyone and anyone. This is all inclusive. Anyone and everyone who wants to. Who just wants to. Live a godly life in Christ Jesus will, not might, not probably, will suffer persecution. I hate to say this. I know. I I love saying this. If you're not suffering some degree of persecution, I'll just leave it there. Because God's word says that everyone who just wants to live a godly life will suffer persecution. Now, does that mean imprisonment? Absolutely not. It it, it doesn't necessarily mean imprisonment. Does that mean martyrdom? No, it doesn't mean martyrdom. But to some degree, some degree, people are going to think you're cray at work. Some degree, your own f- friends and family will be like, yo, he is just like been going to church these days. And like he's just like getting drinking the Jesus juice. And like, I don't even know. Wait, you, you give how, what percent of your money to church? Like, isn't that, that's like kind of cultish. 
to some degree, there will be persecution. Friends, let me say this as plainly as I know how, based on God's word, right? Because again, you don't, you don't want to hear my thoughts. You want to hear God's voice. So I, I just, I'm prayerfully, sincerely saying with my heart, as I submit it to God right now, this is as plainly as I know how, based on scripture, here's what you need to know. If you want to follow God's perfect plan for your specific life, you must pay attention to the Spirit's prompting. You must expect the unexpected. And you must accept pain and challenges as normative. As, you know what, this is just part of the, this is part of the plan. This is part of the game. This is part of the story. Because let me tell you something, friends. Anything less than those three things right there, anything less than embracing those principles, anything less than that, and let me tell you what you're doing. If you, if you, even if one of those, you don't, you're like, nope, not doing that. Anything less than accepting all three, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure later on. You're setting yourself up. You're delaying and, and, and putting interest on, on more pain that awaits you down the future. Does that make sense? Anything less than embracing those three things and you are setting yourself up for disappointment. See, because friends, let me tell you something. It takes courage. It takes boldness to follow God's will for your life. Which is absolutely why I love the way the passage ends here. Let's read this last verse together here. Verse 24, it says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's an incredible way to end this passage. Friends, I've shared with you this morning three particular points, okay? And the band, in just a minute, they're going to lead us in a, in a time of response and a time where we give our offerings and our tithes. But I also, before they do that, I want to leave you with one question as well. Kind of think of it as one challenge. You can go ahead and jot this down in your notes as well. Uh, this is a thought uh, that I would love for you to wrestle with uh, during this upcoming week. I'd love for you to talk about it on the car ride home. I'd love for you to talk about it and discuss it, wrestle with it in your small groups. Uh, and I'd certainly love for you to wrestle with it in just a minute when we uh, sing this last song, when we present our tithes and offerings. And that is this, that, that thought, this challenge is this. What if following God's plan for your life was more about increasing your holiness than your happiness? Would that be okay with you? Would it be okay with you if God's will for your life, as we learned last week in the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians, where it clearly says, God's, it is God's will for you to be what? To be sanctified. Oh, but Pastor Tom, I don't know. Should, should I go for this promotion or not? Should I move over here or not? I don't know about those things, but I do know God's will for you is to be sanctified. What did we say sanctified was? Sanctified is, is being holy. What did we say being holy was? Being holy is being set apart, living apart from the world, not living like the world. The world makes its decision based on finances. The world makes its decision based on this. The world makes its decision based on these relationships. But no, no, no. To be set apart is to not make your primary decisions based on those primary motivating elements, but to, for you to be set apart, for you to be holy, for you to be sanctified is to put God first. And so what if his will for you was to become more holy? Not necessarily for you to be more happy. Would that be okay for you? Am I allowed to say that? Some of you are like, man, why did I come to church today? It's raining and Pastor Tom's like preaching this. Where's the happy messages? Well, here's the deal, friends. God's will for your life, God's will for your life, is to increase your holiness. And happiness, happiness is thrown into the mix. It's true. 
And it's never the other way around. It's never like you try and pursue happiness and you all of a sudden, oh, look at me, I'm so holy. No, that doesn't, it never works that way. It never works that way. God's will for your life is to increase your life's holiness, to increase your sanctification. And in that process, happiness is thrown into the mix. It's never the other way around. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to process some of these principles together. We're going to pray through some of these principles together. In a moment, the band's going to lead us in one last song, and we're going to present our tithes and offerings to him. And we're just going to ask that God would help us to wrestle with these truths, to be uncomfortable with these truths. It's okay. I'm not afraid of discomfort. Uh, but to come out in a place where we are drawn closer to him. Does that make sense? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, your spirit prompts as it did in the Old Testament, as it did in the New Testament, and as it does in the year 2019. Your spirit is prompting. Your spirit right now, I believe. Uh, I believe in you. I believe in the power of Jesus. I believe uh, in the truth of scriptures. And I believe uh, that your spirit is alive and well. And that your spirit wants to invade every single heart uh, in this room right now. And I just pray, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would prompt your men, your women, your children to whatever it is, that next step that they need to take, whatever it is, that difficult conversation that they need to initiate, whatever it is, what, whatever wrong they need to confess and make right, whatever thing that they need to repent of, whatever bold step they need to make, Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, as you prompt your people, that your people would surrender to the Spirit and that, and that when they feel bound up and tied up and wrapped up, that they would find sweet release the moment of obedience. That like my sister Grace, that they would find sweet release as soon as their foot hits the water, as soon as they get out of the boat and take a step closer to the risen Savior that is Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you would help us to expect the unexpected. I pray, Father, that you would help us to accept pains and challenges. That for me, God, that's the one that really gets me all the time because Somewhere in my thinking, I just believed Hollywood. Somewhere in my thinking, I believed fairy tales. And I thought that if I'm living God's will, that I shouldn't experience pain and challenges. But that's so wrong. That's not, that's not true. That's not true. Because when I look at scriptures and I want to look at Jesus, Jesus himself, who was perfectly in your will, was led to the cross. So then why would I think it's any different for me? So help me to have that kind of mentality. Help my brothers and sisters here to have that kind of mentality this morning. I'm going to do something real quick. As you keep your eyes closed, I'm going to go ask you right now. If, you, if you're someone right now who feels God prompting you, the Holy Spirit prompting you, eyes closed, everyone, no one's looking, no one, no one except for me, okay? Go ahead and raise your hand. If you feel like the Spirit, I want to pray for you right now. I see those hands. Awesome, awesome. Keep them raised. Keep them raised. You, you feel God's prompting you to do something. Amen, amen. So many people with their hands raised right now. Right now, I want to pray for you specifically. If your hand is raised, right now. I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for every single man and woman and child who has their hands raised right now, Lord. They sense, they feel your spirit prompting them. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I'm not pretending to know, but I just know that they've taken a step of faith right now and their hands are raised right now. So I pray, Father, that your good, pleasing, and perfect will would work out in their lives, that you would anoint every man, woman, and child with their hands raised right now as your spirit prompts them, Lord. Help them to be bold in the name of Jesus. Give them boldness. Give them strength. Give them compassion. Give them wisdom. Your word says if anyone of you lacks wisdom, ask for wisdom, and he should not waver. So, Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom to every hand that's raised. Give Give power to every hand that's raised. Give mercy and grace to every hand that's raised, Lord. We love you. You can put your hands down. Lord, we love you. And we offer up this song to you right now. We offer up our tithes and offerings to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, would you give us a like? Also, would you hit the subscribe and the notification buttons? 
and then you'll be notified about all future content that we post here. Also, if you want to get involved with our community, please fill out a connect card and one of our pastors will be sure to follow up with you. Thank you so much for checking out this channel. God bless you.